And we are back on the zero hour. I, as always, am your host, Richard R.J. Escal. Is capitalism a religion? And if so, is it demanding human sacrifice of us, especially now in the era of COVID-19? Uh, my next guest has some thoughts on that subject. I always look forward to speaking with her. Lynn Paramore is a cultural historian and a writer, and she's written on both these related topics for the Institute for New Economic Thinking. She has an interview with the author Eugene and philosopher Eugene McCarraher, whose new book is The Enchantments of Mammon, How Capital Became the Religion of Modernity. And she also wrote a piece earlier in the year entitled America's Chilling Experiment in Human Sacrifice. So first of all, Lynn, welcome back to the program. Always great to be with you. It's always great to talk with you. And when, of course, when I see America's chilling experiment in human sacrifice, my first reaction is, which one? Uh, there are considerably more than one, but you make it very clear. You're speaking of COVID, you co-wrote that with Jeffrey L. Spear. But let's start with uh, your, I've not yet read, although I've seen it, The Enchantments of Mammon, uh, but you have both read it and spoken with the author. What are your thoughts of his thesis? Well, a lot of us grew up thinking that we were living in a secular age. Uh, the story that we were often given in school is that uh, we left the Middle Ages, the Reformation happened, the Enlightenment happened, we had the rise of capitalism, and human beings really, in the West in particular, really shifted to a secular mindset and sort of gave up the uh, devotion to the invisible realm. Uh, we gave up our sort of totems and taboos, as uh, Sigmund Freud would have put it. And, uh, and now we're sort of getting down to the business of business and, and, and rationality. But there are others who have observed, uh, people like Max Weber and others, um, that actually capitalism ha has religious elements. Uh, you can think of money as the god or, or the god mammon. Uh, this is the great spirit of capitalism. Uh, the, the, the relics are things like the iPhone, uh, you know, and it has a, a, a creed that if you sort of heed the gods of the market, uh, you will achieve salvation. All your needs and wants will be met and your desires fulfilled and uh, you will be saved. Money will flow to perform miracles in your life. And when you think of it that way, and you think of the, the language, uh, whether it comes from sort of self-help, the self-help industry, magazine advertisements, entertainment, the language and mentality that we're steeped in every day, you begin to pick up these signs of capitalism uh, really as the religious uh, sort of system that we live within. And a lot of us are waking up to the fact that this religion has not saved us. In fact, it is actually, as you just mentioned, demanding that we die for it. I was just reading um, a statistic by the National uh, Nurses United, one of the largest uh, nurses unions in the country, and th they, ha they gave a number as of September 28th, it's undoubtedly higher now, that 1,700 uh, healthcare workers in the United States had died of COVID, not uh, through avoidable causes. They lacked PPE. You know, these were uh, um, totally avoidable and unnecessary deaths, as they point out. Uh, and it's hard to collect statistics. I would suspect that the number is even higher um, than what they've been able to ascertain. And of course, this doesn't even cover all the frontline workers who are not healthcare workers, but there have been politicians, um, as I, I'm sure you, you've heard, who have come right out and said, look, people have to die to keep the economy going. So this God is a very, uh, a, a very potent and uh, a, a, not a particularly empathetic God and, and not a particularly humane one. Well, I suppose if I were to play devil's advocate, uh, that uh, some people might say, well, the a collapsing economy causes death too, death by suicide. That it may, you know, if it's just a matter of sacrificing the seventeen hundred to save twenty five hundred or twenty five thousand, that wouldn't be a theological approach. 
that would be a utilitarian uh, f- approach. But uh, so I have, as I say, some ambivalence about the idea. But I would say when you hear a phrase like invisible hand, uh, it seems to me to be the ultimate theological intervention, right? And whenever, and religion, of course, is a complex word and a, and a complicated concept. One can be too facile with it. It means different things to different people but and, and to different scholars. But if you mean religion to be a parascientific explanation of phenomenon, a phenomena uh, and a set of rules uh, that you must obey, and if you obey, you will be rewarded. If you disobey, you will be punished. If you accept that, which is one working definition of religion, then I can see quantifying it as a religion because we do, uh, even like progressive people, when Elizabeth Warren says, I'm a capitalist down to my bones, what does that mean? Uh, Capitalism is an economic form. Uh, how can you be, uh, no one says uh, uh, I'm a Ricardian theorem adherent down to my bones. But if you would say, but people do describe capitalism as uh, as an identity, yeah. which is another thing that religion provides. So as you can see, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, Lynn, was about this was because I'm still wrestling with the concept myself. I uh, My initial reaction, flippant as usual, was that may be doing a profound disservice to even the most fundamentalist of religions. But, you know, I don't really know. Uh, I, I think it's something we should be talking about a lot, though, because I do think it's invoked as a set of invisible principles uh, that have weight that we don't can't quantify. And that when we do quantify, we as you know, because you deal a lot with the culture of economics, it's in things like GDP, which are entirely non-physical and, and don't necessarily, and free, you often don't represent the well-being of people. So that if I clean my house and you clean your house, that doesn't contribute to GDP, but we both have clean yeah. houses. If you hire me to clean your house and I hire you to clean my house, GDP goes up. Well, nothing has changed. Uh, except, uh, you know, whoever has the bigger house gets the better of the deal. Uh, So I guess that's theological. Uh, I guess I'm coming around to this point of view. I don't know. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the invisible hand. And uh, for folks that that might not know the the history of that term, it, of course, comes from Adam Smith's uh, book, The Wealth of Nations. And he talks talks about the invisible hand as the, it really a supernatural force. I mean, it, it is he, that, that is exactly the way he describes it, something that we can't see or taste or touch, that if we act in our own self-interest as individuals, this invisible force will come in and arrange things for the good of the whole society. How does that happen? By magic. I mean, Adam Smith really doesn't have an explanation for it other than to say, well, it just, it sort of happens just the way the planets align themselves. And he actually, when I say uh, I'm using that, you you know, astronomical uh, sort of analogy, he was thinking that way. He had actually written about the motions of the heavenly bodies and very much had these ideas in mind when he was writing, approaching the economy as a subject. So it's just the way things are supposed to move and move us. And he had a view of human nature. You know, one, one thing that's common to religions is they have origin myths, origin stories. You know, right. you don't call it a myth if it's your religion. <laughs> but um, Adam Smith had one, too. He said that human beings, uh, our, our original impulse as humans was to, as he put it, truck and barter. Right. That was right. our original right. instinct. Now, where did he get that? Well, pardon the phrase. He pulled it right out of his behind. It was right. it was just something he made up. It sounded, you know, plausible. And he was being an armchair anthropologist and he just threw it out there. And people took that, uh, you know, it, since we're talking in religious language, they took that as the gospel. And Adam Smith's ideas, which were very much about storytelling and analogies mm-hmm. and uh, p- colorful language to describe how uh, he thought the economy might function. He remember he was 
writing and living in a time where people were trying to suss out rules about how uh, bodies in motion worked. You know, this right. was the great age of sort of figuring out the system. And, and in a very mechanical way, in a Newtonian in a mechanical way. Yeah. And, and the human beings must be driven by X. Well, this is a myth about human beings, and it's not really the way we work, but the religion of capitalism insists that it is true. This is a sacred idea that competition is ultimately for the best of society, uh, that you know the, 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 the market will decide what is best, not governments, uh, not we the people, et cetera. And so you, I think one of the things that... Um, Eugene McCarr, who wrote this book, The Enchantments of Man Mammon, really uh, susses out in a very nuanced way, is how our country is built on these sort of opposing ideas. You know, on the one hand, we have this idea of competition, and then we have another religious idea about brotherhood, which is also right. baked into the, you know, the sacred text of our nation. And these two things are kind of ill-fitting. Uh, and trying to make them work together is something I think we're still struggling with right now. We're struggling with it in the COVID crisis. How do we get our our economy working while still caring about our neighbor? I'm not sure we have figured that out. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. Okay, I'm starting to come around, Lynn Paramore. <laughs> and, uh, and one of the things I'm coming around about, in the early 60s, my parents loved this record. There was a comedy group in uh, London called Beyond the Fringe. And uh, a lot of famous people came out, Dudley Moore, people like that. And uh, they had this routine on the record because my parents played it over and over again, uh, where it was uh, this religious sect. And uh, they'd say, okay, Friday, they'd, they'd stand on the corner and say, Friday, the end of the world is ending. The world is ending on Friday. And then Friday comes and there's, okay, it's the end of the world. And then they sit for a minute and nothing happens. And they say, they say, okay, guys, see you next Friday. Um, uh, in other words, failure to predict uh, does not, if you have absolute zealous faith, does not deter you. Well, we got the wrong Friday, right? And to me, that was the story of capitalism and the economics profession after the 2008 financial crisis. Yeah. The, uh, uh, it was like, oh, everything we believed about the self-correcting of the market and financial deregulation and how that was going to blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, no, it crashed. Um, but let's keep going because we still believe in it. Uh, and that to me is in fact a kind of fundamentalist uh, religious viewpoint, right? Yes. And I think fundamentalist is a good word to use because you begin to see how people who don't buy into that fundamentalist line, which is, by the way, as you just pointed out, it's been proven. Uh, there's plenty, there are mountains of evidence, the financial crisis being a, a, a giant mountain of evidence that it isn't true, that the principles, the central pr principles of neoclassical economics, for example, do not model reality effectively. They, they don't have predictive properties. It's not a science the way we would, I think you and I and anybody else would define a science. And if, but if you don't believe you're a heretic, and people right. who are heretics, uh, for example, if you might call yourself a democratic socialist, <laughs> which is right. that that word takes on a very devilish kind of quality. It's a scary word. It's a sinful word. You've sinned against the national creed and, you, you know, you, you, you must be punished. Uh, you're a very dangerous element. And so I, I think that that's another way that we can think about the um, capitalistic mindset as being a religious mindset. And if you're an economist who deviates from the creed, if you're MMT or a Marxist economist or other types, what are you called? You're called a heterodox economist. And what's the opposite of heterodox? Orthodox. That's exactly right. That, and, and heterodox always to me sounds like, it, it, it really does. It sounds like a heretic. It almost sounds like you have some sort of horrible disease. You know, it's, it's not a nice, pretty, happy word. Uh, yes, you're, you're, you're marginalized, not to mention, you know, you, you don't get tenure and you don't get published and you really don't get invited to be part of the church. You're excommunicated, in fact. <laughs> um, and the profession uh, operates this way and pronounces truths, even though uh, Greenspan himself testified in front of Congress that what he understood about the way the economy uh, functioned was not correct.
<laughs> well, I think what the Greenspans, uh, it's a, it's a uh, sidetrack a little bit, but I think what the Greenspans of the world quickly realized is that there, was, there would be no consequences. Also a theological, that I think at the moment that he said that, he thought, well, I better, you know, lay the groundwork. And a lot of people thought that in the economics profession for continued uh, prominence. And then, no, there are going to be no consequences for this. So, yeah, heterodox, orthodox, uh, no consequences for being wrong, provided you're part of the priesthood. All of that does add up to a kind of uh, a certain kind of theological uh, rigidity. That's the, well, that for me, that's the economics profession. Then you have pundits and politicians. Business and, writers. Yeah, business writers for sure. And then you have the population at large that's Im imbibed this, right? I mean, you just, people say, well, you know, we got to compete, we got to get ahead. And, you know, it's, it's better that way. And it creeps into policy language, helping. This is one I, I, I've written about. I was, I was, uh, you know, when an Obama platform or a Romney platform both use the same language, we got to prepare workers to compete for the jobs of the future. Why do they have to compete? Why is competition a necessary element of being an employee, much less being uh, an employer? But there again, too, you know, you start to see the uh, the, the footprints, the spore of theology everywhere, I guess, once you start looking for it. Uh, what have we missed in terms of this idea that, what haven't we talked about yet in terms of this idea that capitalism might be kind of a, a religion? Well, you know, I was just thinking as you were talking about competition, how it's ingrained to us so early on in school. I mean, and there are these religious elements. I mean, look at the sort of high school football team, right? I mean, there are places when where you know the church and the football team are the are the two big, uh, you know, kind of social cohesion forces in the community, and it's, it's all about competition. Now, their children play cooperatively when they're sort of naturally amongst themselves. You know, they they can play cooperative games. They can run uh, just for the joy of running. It, they don't have to beat the person next to them and and uh, and 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 win the ribbon. But we're inculcated very early that we are here to compete and that has a negative consequences it has uh, negative consequences for cooperation and it actually doesn't work very well in many workplaces where we actually have to work as a team etc I mean again you have those sort of these these competing elements but I think you know one one thing that um, that I think Makar really gets at in his book and that I think is so int intriguing is if capitalism is a religion it's really a sign that we may as human beings have, you know, maybe you don't have to call it theological, but we have yearnings to be connected to something greater than our individual selves, greater than our individual bank account. Some people would think of that as, a, as, a, as spiritual longings. Uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be spiritual, I, I, I don't think. You know, the poet William Wordsworth talked about communing with nature. Uh, as kind of a, a reverent experience. Um, I, I think we have longings and, and motivations far outside what the capitalist system or religion has assigned to us. And I think that is something that, that you know, we, we've kind of lost sight of. And it's the kind of thing that would help us during a crisis like the one that we are now experiencing, um, that, that kind of reverence for life. Um, Macarthur and others uh, are fond of quoting the 19th century critic John Ruskin, who very famously said, "There is no wealth but life." That's mm -hmm. that's 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 the primary wealth that we have. John Ruskin also said, "You can either make a man out of the creature or a tool out of the creature, but you cannot do both." That's uh, and um, one of my favorite quotes, by the way, because uh, that's what we're struggling against now. And we can close this competition portion of it by, you know, the other thing that liberal as well as uh, traditionally conservative political rhetoric says is we want to make sure that everybody that everybody's on a level playing field. Well, it's not a game. You know, so uh, what's with the playing field? Uh, back to your high school. I thought of that with your high school and competition. So, OK. I'll bite. There is definitely theological uh, a theological dimension 
to our embrace of uh, capitalism. And uh, there is certainly an irrationality that we associate with religion in some of its extreme and fundamental forms. And uh, there's certainly a punishment for deviating from orthodoxy. I mean, we've, we've identified a number of factors, I'm sure, you and and Makara have uh, both identified, uh, you know, language usage and so on as well. But if we accept that it is that kind of religion um, that we've just been describing, then of course we are now in uh, what should be, but f is not enough for an, uh, of one for most people. We should now be experiencing a new crisis of faith yes. because, because of the pandemic. Uh, because the, um, as one of my regular guests, Richard Wolf's new book title says, the sickness is the system. And um, here we have yet again, in a more fundamental way, our economic theology of capitalism failed to protect us continues to fail to protect us, fails to provide for us, fails to respond uh, in a timely way. And uh, there is no rational human being who can think, well, Moderna, you don't have to give Moderna money. They'll just produce it because we need it. And they'll give it to everybody. You know, uh, Pfizer, they're on it. You know, nobody thinks that. We know the system does not address our needs in 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 normal times, much less in emergency times. And, you know, some people are examining that, but it, you know, as you wrote, uh, you know, you wrote about human sacrifice in, in a time of COVID, which that title made me think of, you know, Metropolis, the silent movie by Fritz Lang, Malak, you know, where they're just yeah, throwing yeah. people to the giant furnace, uh, which is in fact, uh, and Lang's uh, depiction of capitalism as an all devouring religion. That scene, if you recall, is uh, um, the worker is seeing all the other workers uh, throwing fuel into a giant furnace and a worker falls in and is killed. And then he has a vision of the furnace as Malak, this God, ancient God demanding sacrifice and living humans being thrown into it. So it was a political statement of uh, Long's time of uh, the 1920s about capitalism demanding sacrifice. That's what you wrote about in the COVID contact context. I think, I guess it was May of this year. So tell us about that a little bit. Yes, I think that's exactly right. I mean, if we think of capitalism as a religion, and we may also think of it as a false religion. And how do we know a religion is false? Well, if it's not delivering on its promises, its promises for salvation, its promises for a better life, its promises to bring us dignity and happiness. Uh, and for most of us, capitalism has not delivered those promise on those promises. And it has reached a point, you know, as, as we're discussing, that it's actually demanding that we die for it, that we sacrifice sacrifice each other, that we sacrifice not only each other, but the best of our community, our, our, our healthcare workers, the, our teachers, the people who, uh, who who's, whose influence and guidance, uh, you know, is just part of the marrow of our human societies. And it's, we're, we're supposed to throw them into the fire and, and, and not worry about it. And this is, uh, I think there are more and more people beginning to feel very uncomfortable with this state of affairs. And I think if we look at capitalism as a false religion, we can then begin to think about other systems. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be, be theological. Um, but I think again, Makarhurst's point is that we may have these, you know, yearnings and longings that we don't need to sort of poo-poo and think, well, we live in a secular, you know, sort of framework and you know never mind anything that has to do with enchantment well no maybe it's okay to talk about enchantment maybe that maybe the religious longing could be uh channeled into uh, a, a kind of human communion or again a reverence for nature that would probably help us with the environmental crisis if we approached nature with more of a sense of reverence and and uh the, the preciousness uh, of, of life. 
So, you know, I think that you're right. It's it's a crisis of faith and also a beginning to question what else is out there. And maybe those things that sounded so heretical. Uh, a lot of young people, for example, are hearing the word socialism and they're not thinking of the, of people with horns sticking out of their head. They're thinking, OK, this is a system that has somewhat different values, that, that, that has different hierarchies, that has different relationships between uh, people and each other and people and the natural world. And, you know, it's, it's OK to think that way. You're not going to suddenly be struck by lightning and <laughs> vanish from the face of the earth. Look at AOC. You know, you could actually even uh, possibly get elected in this country. Look at my old boss, Bernie, who I don't I haven't <laughs> looked lately, but for four years, he was the most popular politician uh, in the United States, self-proclaimed yeah. democratic socialist. You yeah, know? a proud heretic. Well, we like, you know, we're a funny society, Lynn, because we like religion in many ways, but we like our heretics too, man. We like, it goes back to that duality of uh, individualism versus uh, communion or brotherhood. We like people who just shake things up and no, I'm not going for it. So uh, I think a lot of Bernie's appeal besides, you know, he made sense, I think, but uh, was, you know, he wasn't one of those guys. He didn't buy you know, you could trust him. He was speaking his mind. So, uh, you know, it's fascinating because, uh, but I want to get back. I know what I do, want to do now. I, I want to get back to this notion of the things that religion has traditionally given us. Now, maybe not Puritan religion, maybe not, you know, we could argue Calvinism or, you know, what, what have you. But in general, you know, what, Religion at its best does, and I'm not uh, unilaterally anti-religion by any means. I think there's a lot of value in it as well as, you know, it can be used, well, for one thing, it's always been controlled by men, so you know, we could go on with all of that, but... Um, and, and in capitalism, that remains uh, consistent. Oh, for sure, and <laughs> um, absolutely. So what we've got you know, you talked about enchantment in its various forms. The notion that what capitalism I don't think can ever offer. I mean, in a sense, it's a millenarian religion in that even the, you know, a lot of people in my eye may be struggling now, but you know, I could win the lottery. That's sort of like, you know, salvation is coming, but it doesn't offer a way of looking at the beauty of a bird in a tree or, you know, a sunset or a starry sky or, it, it, you know, it's got none of, as you say, that reverence for nature or that search for the still small voice within or some of the other things that religion has offered people. It is strictly transactional, yeah. it seems to me. And if you base your secular theology on something so mechanical, so Newtonian, to get back to that, and so transactional, your life is going to feel empty, I think, and you'll ultimately come to this question of sacrifice. And by the way, I I wrote at the time, around the same time, maybe April or May, you know, I'm at very high risk because I have a couple chronic conditions that are normal, that are normally well controlled, but I do not want, you know, I'm, it would not be good if I got this thing. Um, so I wrote something, I don't, I don't want to die for your damn economy. And I forget, I wrote another thing. My kids were bored. So we killed a stranger because, uh, I put something on a neighborhood bulletin board. People weren't observing distancing. I'd say, you know, some of us are at risk. And they said, well, my kids were bored. That was the answer I got. I said, well, I'm not asking you to keep your kids in, just keep them six feet away. You know, you don't know what it's like to have bored kids. Well, actually I do, but you'll never know who you've killed, you know, basically. And the notion that we've, and I think it does, is a reflection of a kind of capitalist mindset that in this liberal enclave where I live, not that they, these people were, I don't know their politics, but that we've actually reached a point where it's publicly known that you might kill somebody, but you do it anyway. But you do it anyway. Because my household, my kids, my Volvo, you know, it, 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 my, 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 that to me is an internalization of the theological worldview of capitalism. You think that's fair? Yeah. And it also, um, it really negates the idea that Adam Smith had of an invisible hand that's supposed to take our individual competitive spirit and self-interested behavior uh, and somehow transmute it into the good of society. Actually, it, it doesn't transmute madness. 
ecologically and to the good of society, it may very well destroy human societies. I mean, in the grand scale of things, when we begin to talk about climate change, et cetera, it literally may destroy us. The, the, I think another thing that, that religions, that capitalism in particular as a religion offers, that not every religion offers or promises, it really promises that we can become gods ourselves. And if you look <laughs> at some of the great ca capitalists of our era, a person like Jeff Bezos, for example, there was this fantastic cover story on him in the Atlantic of several months ago. It was before the COVID crisis, but he gave gave the most grandiose pronouncements about where human life was going. And basically, he had conceded that, look, we're going to destroy the planet. Nothing you can do about it. So let's just blast ourselves right. in outer space. You know, we'll have these great um, oscillating cylindrical tubes that we'll live in. And, you know, temperature regulated. It'll be great. I'm not sure who's going to make the law. Laws, probably Bezos himself and some other Silicon Valley tycoons. But you really got the feeling that um, this is a death cult. This is we don't mm -hmm. even we've given up the idea of the wealth of life and and just, you know, screw it. We'll have we'll have some kind of, uh, you know, uh, dispirited life in the sky uh, and, and, and leave Earth behind. And so I think um, when we become that when, when capitalism promises that we'll become gods, we're really becoming monsters. That's a monstrous. Absolutely. Vision. Absolutely. Yeah. Jeff Bezos will rule over a new Jerusalem on a new earth and it shall be called Amazon headquarters three. And meanwhile, Elon Musk, who's playing the same game, uh, launches a car into space while 45 million Americans are living in poverty because he can. And if that is not the arbitrary actions of a childlike would be God, I don't know what is, but these are the people we elevate. And, um, you know, it's insane. And uh, of course, many of us do not worship them. And increasingly, Americans want to regulate them. And I think all that is very well and good. But uh, Lynn Paramore, before we go, any closing thoughts on this subject? I'll let you have the last word. Yes. I mean, I, I, I have to say, um, my skeptical voice says, those of us that may they think that we're moving into a, a better era now that we have a Biden ad, a administration coming. Um, these same Silicon Valley tycoons, et cetera. I mean, are they really going to be reined in? Are they really going to be regulated? Are businesses really going to be held accountable? What is the pharmaceutical industry going to get up to with its reputation sort of, you know, glittering and jazzy? Um, remember, this is the industry that brought us the opioid crisis. So I would say be very watchful because this administration, I think, is uh, is enchanted by mammon in the same way the Obama administration was. I mean, it's it's uh, I think it's preferable to what we could have had, but um, it, we're still this administration is not thinking outside the temple of mammon. I don't think. And uh, but fortunately, there's a stronger counterforce building than yeah. we had during the Obama era. Well, Lynn Paramore, cultural historian, writer, you can check out both these articles at the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Thanks for writing them. And as always, uh, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks so much for having me. Always great to talk to you. Really enjoyed it. Same here. And we'll be right back after this, God willing. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.